Oh no. I need to call the police. What were they thinking? I got attacked by a woman around 35 years old wearing a hat and dark glasses. Can you guess her age? That's the best description I could manage. I'm having a hard time understanding this. Let me start from the beginning. Maybe it will make more sense. I'm hoping that by writing everything down, I can figure something out. The shock of being attacked without reason in public is so different from anything I've experienced before. I just can't wrap my head around it. Just a few hours ago, life was great. I had a wonderful life, a beautiful home, money in the bank, and a husband who adored me. But that's not why I was so happy leaving the office on Monday. It was for a more private reason. My husband was away on business, and I had plans with my lover John when I got home. John is a recent addition to my life, and he's taken me to new places in bed. That's why I was walking to my car with a smile on my face. As I approached, I felt a hand on my shoulder. Hoping it was John, I turned around, only to be met with a fist to my face from an angry woman. I barely had time to see her face before falling to the ground, letting her kick me in the back without a word. Eventually, she left, and fearing she might return, I called for help. The ambulance took me to the hospital. I arrived before the night rush, so I passed out a bit and was quickly attended to. Besides a split lip and some bruises, I was okay. They warned me about delayed concussion symptoms and told me to ice the bruises before sending me home. The police questioned me, but with a vague description of a slender blonde woman in a hat and dark glasses, catching her seemed unlikely. I couldn't even tell if she was a natural blonde or give a reason for the attack. I asked the police for a ride back to my car, but they said it was against the rules. I tried to put on a smile, but my lip hurt too much. Attempting to call John for a ride failed, so I had to call a taxi. My new plan for the evening was painkillers, maybe vodka, ice for the bruises, and a long bath until it was time to call my husband. He always knew how to help me make sense of things and make me laugh when I was sad. I wouldn't be surprised if he dropped everything and drove four hours home after hearing what happened. I guess I was always his priority. I had only been home for about half an hour. The bathtub was full and the ice was cooling my martini when there was a knock on the door. Thinking it was the Chinese takeout I ordered, I opened the door. The next thing I knew, I had vague memories, and as I tried to sit up, my head hurt terribly. Something had dried on my face. Scratching a bit, I found blood under my fingernail. Panic set in as I felt my entire face gently. Thankfully, my nose wasn't broken, but my cheek was, and I had a black eye. Turning my head slowly, I saw dried blood spatters on the floor. Continuing my inspection, I found a lump on the back of my head and a bruise, likely from hitting the floor. Despite the pain, I straightened up. Hallucinations and flashes of images played in my mind. I distinctly saw a stocky woman with long black hair and almost bushy eyebrows, her face hidden by a scarf. That's all I saw, except for a wooden handle or bat flying toward my eyes. I woke up embarrassed, still on the couch. The clock showed 5 a.m., and I had a terrible headache. Every movement felt like a bowling ball hitting the walls inside my skull. As I staggered into the kitchen, I felt pain in my groin. The attacker must have kicked me there. I swallowed two painkillers and staggered to the bathroom. The mirror revealed an unpleasant sight. Whatever they slapped me with, my nose was okay, but my cheek was broken, and I had a black eye. Who are these people? This woman and the one from this afternoon. What's going on? I didn't think I had any enemies, even though I'm a real estate agent. I wondered if I should call more than one ambulance, but decided against it. Yesterday afternoon, the doctor advised me to watch for delayed concussion for eight hours. It's been longer since I got drubbed the second time. I also thought about calling the police, but chose not to. Our front door wasn't visible from the hotel grounds, and I had less information to provide than last time. One woman accidentally attacking me is one thing, but two is just weird. Despite the late hour, I decided to call Dave. He would know what to do. Oh no, Dave. What did he think when he tried to call me last night? Like he always did and I didn't answer? He would try calling my cell phone and home phone and then ask where I was. I hope this didn't make him think I was sneaking out of the house when he wasn't here. I've always been incredibly careful in my dealings, 
wouldn't it be ironic if a false tip gave me away? Taking my mobile phone, I checked how many missed calls there were from my husband. Strange, but there were none. I picked up my home phone and dialed the number to get a list of my latest actions. The last unanswered call was made three days ago. What the? I couldn't remember the last time Dave didn't talk to me when he was gone. In fact, it was part of my safety net that I would routinely call him on his hotel phone, citing the supposed dangers of using a cell phone too much before going to meet my lover at a motel or on very rare occasions, inviting him out here. This reminded me that I had called John on my cell phone the previous afternoon and had not yet deleted the recording. I wasn't stupid enough to store his number in my phone, and without a trace, there was no evidence. There were several photos on it that should never have seen the light of day. But my phone was the only place they were kept, and they were hidden there. I also made sure it wasn't locked with a regular password or one of those boilerplate items. Just my fingerprint and a huge, strong password. Dave thinks it's a work requirement not to share my password. On the rare occasions when he needed to use my phone, I opened it for him and never let him out of my sight. I decided it was safer to store the photos on my phone that I can protect than any other media that could be discovered. I deleted the call to John, left a message in his message bank, and noted that he also did not answer my previous call. I'm surprised Dave didn't call. Despite the early hour, I called him. I really needed to hear his comforting voice. The call went straight to the message bank, which was weird. Maybe he lost his charger and his battery died or something. This wasn't the first time. By this time, it was already after five in the morning, and I had a show. There was no way I could show up looking like I did now, so I put on more makeup than usual to cover it up. After all, I had a whole arsenal. I should probably explain this. You see, all through high school, I was very ordinary. You've all met those who watched from the sidelines as all the boys worth their salt ignored them to go after the athletic, popular, bright girls. Although I was proud that I was not like some other plain ones, they exposed themselves to everyone, mistakenly believing that being popular meant they had succeeded. Thus, I haven't any relationship when I left school at 16. My parents were not overly ambitious towards me, and were happy to support me as I attended a series of evening courses to gain some administrative qualification while I worked as a waitress. In my spare time, I lost my purity to someone who, I realized too late, was a smart carnivore. I realized this when, the next morning, after a quick, not convenient closeness in his hotel room, he asked me to leave. I chalked it up to experience and thought that this episode had made me an expert at choosing carnivores. That did not happen. My next two closeness encounters ended just as disastrously. The one after them was a guy with less experience than me. Here, I already left him after the first night. This is how I sailed through life until I was 20. That's when Dave came into my life. Dave was a year ahead of me in school and seemed to be my male equivalent. He was tall and thin, but nothing else about him was striking. We got to talking at the restaurant where I worked, where he invited several clients to lunch. After the first meeting, I learned enough to understand that he was a man with a clear career plan and determination to get things done. I accepted the date, and the rest, as they say, is history. I hooked up with him about two weeks after meeting, and it was clear we were both new to this, making it awkward. We were both open to learning and used each other for that. If I had to describe my life a year before he turned 21, I'd say it was good. I had a boyfriend who was growing and clearly loved me. We weren't invited to fancy events, but we didn't mind. We moved into an apartment, and I was taking a real estate course paid for by Dave when my crucial birthday came. Dave celebrated his first big bonus by treating me. I got my own car, a voucher for two days with a beauty consultant, and a bigger engagement ring than I expected. I said yes, drove the car, and delayed using the voucher. Oh, I wish I could tear up that voucher. Then I could have a husband with his phone on and a face without bruises. Dave reminded me about the voucher, but I was busy planning a simple wedding. We didn't have many friends. In the end, I decided to use it for a little treat for myself before the big day. That's when I found out it was for two days with Caroline, an elegant woman in her 30s. I don't know what qualities she had, but she knew how to showcase femininity. Our first stop was a hairdresser, where I had a major makeover. I have to admit I was nervous about how it would turn out. 
The rest of that first day was spent shopping. Caroline took me to upscale stores, and later that evening, she used my phone to ask Dave to update my credit card. At the end of the day, looking in the mirror at my new hairstyle and clothes, I almost called Caroline to tell her not to worry. The next day, the hairstyle and clothes truly made me beautiful. The following day at the salon, I got pampered with a pedicure, manicure, facial, and scalp massage. Then I met Colin, who claimed to be more fun than a tree full of monkeys and, if you believe him, used to be a beautician for some famous stars. He and Caroline transformed my face over the next two hours, including some corrections. I wasn't allowed to look until they said I was perfect. When I saw my reflection, I involuntarily took a step back. That's when Caroline's true genius emerged. The clothes and hairstyle that seemed out of place before now framed a face that I had to admit was beautiful. I couldn't believe it. The change was stunning. Caroline made me look up from admiring myself for Colin's two-hour lecture on how he uncovered the natural masterpiece that was me. I thanked him and Caroline for this life-changing experience. If I had known how it would actually affect me, I might have been shocked. Dave did a funny double-take when I got home but quickly recovered, telling me it just showed me as he always saw me. That night was the wildest in bed, and three days later, we were married. The honeymoon was confusing for men, and handsome guys who never paid me attention were now vying to dance with me. I supported them when Dave didn't mind. He was the first to admit that dancing wasn't his favorite. Despite all the attention, it still didn't hit me that the game had changed. This realization started when the wedding photo album arrived. I saw that I was absolutely stunning, and for the first time, I felt that I had married a man a bit shorter than me, noticeable in various settings. I probably feel this way deep down, even today, which is neither logical nor fair. What have I achieved in the five years since my marriage compared to Dave? He built his business and was on his way to becoming a millionaire. I used my looks to sell real estate. Despite the unequal success, for some reason, I felt superior. Five years later, after revealing my true self, I became popular, praised, entitled, and within six months, an unfaithful wife. In my defense, resisting temptation was extremely difficult. Suddenly my mind, which believed my body was a 5 out of 10, was pursued by men who were 9 out of 10. It took waking up with a third such man for me to realize they were just more attractive versions of the carnivore who took my honor. From that point on, I had complete control in choosing my partners. Now, with my bruised face, I decided to put on a good layer of concealer and foundation. Feeling sorry for myself, I attempted to call Dave every 15 minutes, but had no luck. It took an hour and a half of layering until I managed to hide everything to my satisfaction. Unfortunately, I had no success in communicating with my husband or explaining the strange behavior of the two women. To ease my loneliness, I made coffee and drank it, feeling more alone than I had in years. Making friends with women was always a challenge for me, and with Dave's unresponsiveness, I found myself isolated in my darkest hour. With an hour to spare, I texted John to call me when he could, then occupied myself with meaningless content in my inbox until it was time to leave for the office. Carrying the laptop bag and luxury briefcase Dave bought me last year to my car in the detached garage, I placed them in the back seat. Slamming the door, I turned to the driver's door and unexpectedly, she was standing right in front of me as I turned away from the back door of my car. I can only assume she must have been hiding behind the garage wall or somewhere else when I re-entered. The incident happened so quickly that it was hard to recall when it ended. I remember falling to the ground feeling someone's foot step on my hands, which I instinctively raised to protect my face. The blows eventually stopped, and I ran towards the house. The brutality of the attack was utterly shocking, and my face was burning. Leaning against the door briefly, I stumbled towards the downstairs bathroom. The mirror revealed three long scratches on my left cheek, and two on my right, apparently caused by raking fingernails. My right arm and forearm hurt, but fortunately nothing was broken. I called the police again, then Dave and John while I waited for the cops to arrive. No one answered. I felt so alone. The office called just after nine, questioning why I had abandoned the client. 
They only calmed down a bit when I explained the attack while working for a real estate company. The police were of little help, and it seemed like Media Stink thought I was wasting their time with vague descriptions. They interviewed neighbors and asked if I needed an ambulance. I didn't. I needed my husband to answer my call. In complete confusion, I closed the door behind the cops, walked into the living room, and yelled at the photo on the mantel where Dave and I were standing. Next time, you'll take your phone charger, Dave, even if I have to pack it for you myself. An attack by one random woman wasn't unusual, and two was statistically unlikely, but three was almost impossible. So it was time for me to carefully consider the possible reasons why I had so many enemies. Unfortunately, I couldn't think of anything. This time, makeup couldn't conceal the scratches. To worsen matters, I had to remove earlier applied creams with makeup remover pads to apply a little disinfectant to my new scratches. It's unknown what kind of microbes this psychopath had under her nails. The scratches burned intensely, and the disinfectant felt like I had poured gasoline on my skin. The task was made even more difficult by the fact that my right arm was starting to feel raw and bruised. By the end, my face was red and blotchy, and the last attacker must have been wearing heels or something, as bruises appeared on my arms and forearms in distinct forms. I called Dave again, eager to hear his voice, but the call went to voicemail once more. Frustrated, I considered sending him an email, hoping he'd hurry home when he reads it. The issue was my laptop in the car. Walking down the stairs awkwardly like a 90-year-old, I couldn't ignore the noticeable bruises on my lower back, legs, and groin. Trying to turn the bolt on the front door, fear held me back. I scolded myself for cowardice. Remembering real estate seminars, I gave myself a pep talk. The motivation behind the beatings was a mystery, but after the three women took out their anger on me, it seemed like a case of mistaken identity. That's what I thought. Now thinking logically, I considered viewing the garage from the back door to surprise and ambush someone. Walking from room to room, checking windows, the route to the garage, I realized there were blind spots. The secluded backyard left me vulnerable without witnesses. My phone rang. Dave. Finally, I rushed towards it, ignoring the protest of my bruised and battered limbs. I was disappointed. It wasn't Dave. It was my office arranging a meeting with a client at a hotel in 30 minutes. Excuses about being injured fell on deaf ears. They were working lean, and if I couldn't handle it, they made it clear they could find a replacement. The challenge remained, getting to my car safely. A light bulb went on, I'd call a taxi. I did just that, giving very specific instructions about parking in the middle of the driveway where I could see everything from the house. After all, there could be someone hiding behind the garage or behind the hedge on the property line. But of course, with the taxi driver as a witness, I would be safe. While waiting for the taxi, I did everything I could for my face. Ten minutes later, the taxi horn prompted me to make one last visual check outside, and then an awkward dash to the safety of the taxi. I didn't really relax until we were a block away from home. The driver was a woman, which worried me, but after she asked where I was going, she lost interest in me. Fifteen minutes later, nearing our destination, I realized that I had eaten my fill. The house keys were in my briefcase in the back seat of my car, parked in the garage. Ordering the taxi back would make me at least 25 minutes late for the meeting, and the client might well be very indignant at being set up a second time and demand my head from the agency. I decided to somehow get through the scheduled meeting. I could show the client the exterior and report some bureaucratic mistakes with the keys. I'll almost certainly miss the sale, but hopefully I won't get fired. I called Dave again before reaching home, waiting half an hour for the client, who arrived by taxi. She was a tall, dark-haired woman around 30, quite pretty except for the eyes hidden behind dark glasses. Carrying a trendy huge bag, she looked at a paper, then walked towards me, swallowing my excuse for the key fiasco, but looked irritated when I explained that the best thing I could suggest was to walk outside looking in the windows. Luckily, I knew everything about the property by heart, so I didn't have to refer to any notes also left in the briefcase. I knew in my heart that if this house didn't sell quickly, the owners might lower the price enough for Dave and me to buy it. It was a beautiful green area, populated by young urban professionals. Dave and I would fit in perfectly here. We walked out into the backyard, 
where I pointed out a spacious art studio located separate from the main house. After I finished listing its features, I walked over to the master bedroom window and peered through the gap in the curtains to see how good the view was. I heard an inappropriate sound behind me. Looking back, I would describe it as a clicking sound. I turned and noticed the client holding a telescopic baton, one of those self-defense tools often advertised in women's magazines. Her cute expression turned into one of distorted hatred. I believe she hissed bad word before swinging the baton forcefully at my head. The blow hit my hastily raised forearms, causing excruciating pain, and I actually heard a bone crack. I think the woman, in her furious state, heard it too. Her anger seemed to fade as she stood there watching me scream, lowering my hand as the pain overwhelmed me. However, some residual anger remained, and she struck the side of my head. I absorbed most of the blow with my undamaged hand, but it still knocked me to the ground. When I came to, the wild woman was gone, leaving me completely alone. Even though she disappeared, something fell from her purse when she pulled out the baton, a piece of paper that I saw her stuff into her bag. When I examined it, I found a photograph, about a five size, lying face up on the ground. It was a familiar image, one of my favorites. I was perplexed about how this crazy woman got a copy. It was a selfie I took about three months ago, capturing in closeness moment with John. My phone was in my outstretched hand when I took the photo. Despite everything, I had the strength at that moment to press the button, and the excellent framing was purely luck. Recalling the crummy motel room we paid cash for, John and I, eager after weeks without closeness, engaged in dirty and rough closeness. Despite the roughness, I experienced incredible previously unknown pleasure. This photograph became the means by which the woman identified me, leading me to guess she might be Mrs. John, judging by her anger. I never inquired about John's wife, just as we never discussed Dave. I didn't consider it important enough to think about. Before holding my damaged hand, I rolled into a sitting position. I didn't debate internally about calling an ambulance. This time I did so. However, no police involvement to avoid exposing my affairs, which could lead to Dave finding out and result in something terrible. The question of how John's baton-wielding wife got her hands on this photo occupied my mind as I staggered to meet the ambulance. I had never shared this photo with anyone or any other device, not even with John. Was my phone hacked? At the hospital, it was the same triage nurse, ready to call the police. I talked her out of it, convincing her it was an accident. Despite her disbelief, she respected my wishes after I vigorously shook my head when she inquired about my husband. They set my arm, administered strong painkillers, and then ushered me into a taxi. The considerate taxi driver took me straight to my front door, waiting until I entered, locked the door from inside. Against the doctor's recommendations, I washed down the painkillers with a large, very large shot of vodka while simultaneously concocting a story to tell my husband. I left him numerous confused and worried messages that he'll discover when he charges his phone. My attempt to call him again failed, so I remembered my idea to send him an email. Since my laptop was in the car and it was already dark, I wasn't going to take any more chances with another potential attack. Then I recalled our old desktop computer, which we used before getting laptops, and Dave continued to use. I turned it on and went to pour myself some vodka. When I returned, there was a small spinning hourglass on the screen, and under it, the word sink. What's sinking? I responded to the call of nature, which took a while. Ever tried unzipping your pants side zipper with one arm in a sling? When I returned to the office, the computer had finished sinking. What it was syncing with and displaying on the screen was terrible. Well, that clarifies everything. Everything. Who were these awful women and why did they do what they did? Oddly, this knowledge provided some comfort. After the complete confusion of the past 24 hours, what the screensaver showed on our old home computer explained much more. It became clear why, for the first time in forever, my husband didn't call me during his business trip why he didn't answer the calls, why he might never call me again, how I was considered an arrogant person and probably lost the rest of my life. I barely made it to the bathroom when I painfully vomited. Touching the tender left side of my face, 
I felt the purple bruise and scratches on the right before leaving the bathroom to turn off the monitor displaying disgusting destructive photos on the screensaver of a computer I hardly ever used. It displayed the contents of my phone more precisely, the photographs on it. They flashed on the computer screen, changing approximately every 10 seconds. Strangely enough, photographs of houses or specific interior elements were interspersed with much more graphic photographs. I recalled how a couple of weeks ago, my boss hired a tech company to update our phones. I watched like a hawk while the technician played with mine. Now it was obvious that at least one of these changes resulted in the photos I had so carefully hidden on it being transferred to my desktop along with the rest of my photo folder. And if they could see the desktop of the old computer, could they? Oh no. Dave's laptop was much more modern than the old home computer. A feeling of dread came over me as I imagined Dave looking at the hundred or so trophy photographs. Photographs meant only for my personal pleasure. Photos of me and different men in different poses. Can I imagine David capturing photographs of my lover's faces and printing them, taking them to my work, and comparing the faces to the names in their files with the help of our secretary, who always had a soft spot for him? Unfortunately, yes, I can. Names led to addresses and wives. Wives who saw these photographs. Wives who, in my case, provided the blows, scrapes, and bruises. After yet another unanswered call to my husband's phone, I struggled upstairs and checked his wardrobe. But what I saw only made my depression worse. Then, ignoring the terrible photos on the old computer screensaver, I turned on the monitor again and logged into our bank's online website and saw a few tiny numbers where there should have been big ones. I dropped my chin to my chest. The realization of what a spoiled, conniving, entitled person I had become shocked me. The blow was as painful as all my physical injuries combined. Working with both commercial and domestic properties, there was never a shortage of male clients to choose from, and I made a choice. Perhaps in the early days, I tried to be very careful with my lovers. Back then, I had a strict rule, no photos, videos, or any traces. Oh, I did make a few mistakes along the way. I was almost exposed by one guy who wanted to continue the relationship after it had run its course. In my opinion, it was then that I decided to limit myself to married men who had as much to lose as I did. But I calmed down and relaxed some of my rules when it became obvious that Dave trusted me. Implicit error. Big mistake. Huge. I should have stuck to the no photos rule. I kicked myself for my absolute arrogance, wondering how I could let this happen. I became the popular girl I dreamed of being in school, and somehow had to back up that popularity by sleeping with all the hot men. My mistake was thinking that my marriage could withstand the truth about its real nature. I'm not naive enough to believe that Dave would never discover my affairs, but I had a plan ready for that scenario. One I was confident Dave would accept. I figured he wouldn't easily find a replacement on my level, and ultimately, he'd forgive me. My plan hinged on him learning about just one lover. I'd admit my weakness, claim he was a skilled seducer, shed some tears, promise it wouldn't happen again, and then ask him to let me share everything I've kept hidden. As I reflected, I wondered if this was merely a self-preservation tactic, a way to postpone the inevitable realization that Dave had no intention of forgiving me. He didn't catch me in bed with someone else, triggering my rehearsed response. How could I have predicted he'd discover me in cyberspace with dozens of lovers at the same time?